Welcome to the Lighthouse Conversations, a show featuring entrepreneurs and tastemakers from the worlds of art, culture, tech, and of course, food. I'm your host, Hesham Montasser. I'm joined today by fellow Egyptian entrepreneur, Amir Allem. Amir is the founder of El Menus, a food platform he started in 2011 to solve a simple problem he had. What will I eat today? Needless to say, the business grew since then and pivoted from simply digitizing menus to a full-fledged F&B marketplace. El Menu now has over 6,000 restaurants on its platform and 1.5 million customers who use the platform each month. The company raised 8 million last year and is in the market for a new raise that would fuel their expansion across Egypt and opening up other international markets, something we'll get into during our conversation. We have something in common, which is we both went to a German school. You were a few years before me. I'm just joking. You were unfortunately not a few years before me. (laughs) You were quite a few years after me. But uh, let's maybe start there, you know, not specifically the German school, but a bit about your upbringing. Were you always interested in tech? Were you always interested in food? Or were you not interested in either of these two? And all of this sort of happened by happenstance. I'm curious to know how you got from being a kid to the early days of starting your company. When I was six years old, I always knew I wanted to do a food delivery platform. No, I'm joking. So <laughs> this is not how it started. I, I, I started off being just very curious as a person. Um, okay. and, and, and mainly that was the driver for a lot of things that I've ever done. Um, and uh, my, my progression was basically I started off uh, doing uh, uh, squash professionally uh, at a very, very early age. Um, and then uh, was professionally ranked internationally uh, um, at maybe uh, at the age of 12 to 15. Um, and, um, and this, I think, was planted the initial seeds of being someone who's very driven, um, competitive, competitive, yeah, uh, all the all the things that you need in a startup, and most importantly, knowing how to fail and how to win. One day we'll have a separate podcast, so you'll have to explain to us why Egypt is not a- a- able to excel at many sports, but we always excel at squash. <laughs> but this is something we have to cover at some other point. It's amazing, and it makes me very proud, obviously. But uh, we seem to have had a squash streak for the last 30 years. Yes. Uh, but anyway, that's not the topic for today. It's a mystery that, that we should unravel. Um, I went to study computer science um, uh, in the, the American University in Cairo. Um, and then uh, joined corporate for a while, figured out this is not for me. Had too much energy going around and wanted to do so much more. And then figured out, you know what, as, a, as someone who really likes food, there's a very clear problem that people can't really decide uh, uh, where to eat and most importantly, what to eat. So, so there is no, uh, no directory or a platform that helps you understand uh, where the best dishes are around you. But, so, but so can I just pause here for a second? I just want to you know, go deeper in this point because this is now we're looking at probably, I mean, you launched a company in 2011 in its earlier formation. So Fayani, this must have been a conversation you're having in 2010 or so, maybe earlier. Yeah. This is just to put the context for our, our listeners. I mean, you know, revolution time, right? Egypt was the Arab Spring Revolution. Also, it is not your typical uh, story that because you found a problem that you go start the company to resolve this problem. I mean, the guys graduating or the girls graduating out of AUC and you said you, you figured very quickly that you didn't want to be in corporate life. Very quickly for you, it was really quickly. Yeah, and as the people spend five years doing this, maybe make a, lot of, a bit of money and then start thinking about it. I mean, all of this happened very quickly and at a very, very difficult time politically for the country. So can you just unpack here? How did you have that courage and conviction? Yeah, I think it's the engineering mindset. I wasn't really thinking about it as a company. I think about uh, solving a problem, basically, and, and a problem that I've seen myself and others around me face um, and being someone who's obviously doing computer science and technology, spending a lot of my time on the internet, uh, unpacking like what people are doing abroad and, and in the US um, and, and figured out, you know what, P- people all the time are, are figuring out what kind of problems they're passionate about and what they want to solve. And then they go ahead and solve it. What about the timing in terms of where Egypt was at the time? I actually quit my job in January the 1st, 2011. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, I didn't even tell my parents that I quit back then because I didn't want any hassle or like somebody to guilt trip me for like leaving my job, which they never did actually. But I just 
uh, overthought it at the time. Um, and then 25 days later, the revolution happened, which seemed like the, the shittiest decision I could ever ever done. But I sat there in the, in the revolution thinking, what a great time to start a company. Um, and then uh, revolution happened, so much excitement after it, uh, after it was done and over with, uh, more or less. Um, uh, basically, so many people started actually uh, starting companies. I don't know what's the actual reason. I think maybe unleashing potential, people realizing that there is more to be done in life. Life is short. Life is short. All those things that probably happen with, with such uh, you know um, significant events. Um, and then six months later, the menus was born. Uh, it was just a, a website. We gathered so much traffic in very little time, uh, which proved that there was uh, really attraction for this idea. The, the whole country, there was no VC ecosystem. There was very, very, very few startups. There was what I call wave zero, which were like maybe a handful of startups in the country uh, and no VC funding at all. So we stayed maybe two, three years in dramatic political turmoil. And then the other three years, getting seed investment from friends and family and figuring out how to be profitable without any uh, um, external money. And we were actually succeeded in that. Uh, we were doing uh, profitability. We were profitable as a company on the back of ad revenue. And just to kind of be clear, at the time, the, the business model was going to restaurants, which are essentially offline, taking their menus and putting their menus online. There was This was not linked to any delivery mechanism. This is Hashem goes online, probably still uh, desktop based, not even mobile, uh, you know, finds a restaurant he likes um, and basically calls up that restaurant to order. 100%. So basically we had menus digitized for all the uh, top restaurants in the country. So your revenue model was what? What was the business model at the time? The one we had targeted advertising. So it's, it's, we went to the restaurants, told them, you know what, your problem is not getting customers, it's getting the right customers. So if you're opening up in, in one area of the country, you want the people that are probably surrounding that area. And that's, we did location-based advertising. And and did you think about high-end, medium-end, low-end, or let me just find every restaurant possible and just build here? Essentially, it's because it's a marketplace. We all know in marketplaces, you know, it's all about the supply at the beginning, right? So if I have enough supply, I will get the demand. Did you understand that? Uh, uh, right, intuitively, I, I approached it from a from a mindset of 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 a, of a user, which I personally was, which I actually want to see all the menus of all the restaurants. I don't care okay. whether they're high end or low end, because as a foodie, you one day go to a street cart, and the other day you go to a five star hotel restaurant. So that was just the 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 problem definition. And we went out, got all the menus of all the the country, digitized them, and then uh, the traffic. Prove that this was a successful uh, uh, strategy. How big was your team back then? Uh, we were hovering between five to ten uh, at, at the earlier stages. This is like pre-seed stage. Uh, when we got a seed round, uh, a, a mini family and friends one, it was we were maybe fifteen. And did you make a conscious decision of being a sole founder? Because obviously, any VC today will, if you go, me or you, to, to a VC, the first thing they say, are you founder? In the early days, you know, oh, we prefer you to be, co you know, to have at least two, because because of all this. Was that a conscious decision uh, for you to, to be on your own? Because look, I run my own company. I have a co-founder, luckily, who you know, while well, you prefer his brother, but that's a completely different conversation. And uh, it's lonely. Yeah, and it's lonely out there. <laughs> Even with Hany and I together, it's still lonely. For, yeah, you've been doing this by yourself for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. I think there is no uh, uh, you know, preference or VC preference or like right, right and wrong about it. I bet you a lot of the VCs who thought maybe they don't want to invest in like solo founders have so many portfolio startups where they wish these guys <laughs> were solo founders. No, you're 100% right. But did you consciously think about it as I mean any... Did you go and think, you know what, I should consider getting maybe somebody that complements my skill set or no? This didn't even come up. It was a very natural progression. At the first, of course, my, my first inclination, since I, I knew that I, I was not that great of a programmer, I needed to, from day one, get a, a CTO, a, a partner on the okay. on the technical side and a co-founder. And did you? Um, I, I talked to so many people back then, but then the, at 20, 2011, 2013, that time, um, it was so hard to convince someone to, to do a startup, let alone uh, join it full time. So 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 there was when you go to tell someone I'm doing a startup, they, they, they don't even have an idea of, of what that means. So nobody would leave their job and, and go do that. So let alone after filtering people who would actually join, 
you want people who are actually good. So, so it was historically. So, a, did you a, write your own code in the early stages? I was involved uh, in the coding, but I wasn't really writing it. Uh, we, okay. we actually, surprisingly, the the version one of the menus was written by a, a freelance agency who uh, had three partners. And uh, um, as 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 history is always ironic and funny, one of those partners is now our actual CTO. So like almost <laughs> no, nine years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, everything you know goes full. When circle. did he when did he join you that CTO? So he joined us in 2020. Did you explain to him that uh, you know he's coming? He he may have uh, missed all the fun and now he's coming at a. I'm joking. No, I mean different <laughs> people. Different people have different risk profiles, right? And you also grew as a company. Today yeah. you have a very different profile and very different funding uh, profile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it makes sense. I, I, I told him you should come in and fix the bugs that you did in version one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So that was initial version of the menus. When was the revelation that maybe there is more? And also amazingly that you were able to run it as such, which essentially is a different company when you think about it, for so long. Uh, you didn't give up, Yanni. You kept going until the market caught up with you, right? And today you have the ability to obviously monetize through direct ordering, etc., which is your now the food marketplace model that everybody knows about and raves about. So walk us through that. Were you? Did you see this coming, um, or did you wait until you saw some early adopters and then said, "Aha"? Uh-huh, I can do this too. And you walk us through this because it's a very, very pivotal moment for the company, I think. It was. I think the the uh, the first the first uh, principle was basically we wanted, again, to solve a decision problem. And the lovely thing about food is, as as is with music, it's a very open-ended problem. You will never per- perfect it, right? You can't go and say, we have become the platform that when you open it up, it tells you exactly what's the right food for you at the first second. So it's an open-ended problem. It's very subjective. It's It's very... Um, uh, it's, it's a very open-ended and nice problem to, to basically solve for a very long time. Um, and um, when, we, when we did that for a while, we got so much validation that this was an actual problem and people needed a, a very strong solution. And then there isn't globally a lot of platforms solving that exact problem, like with the actual dish that you would want to eat. Um, so many of them have come up and so many of them have gone. Uh, but I think what saved us is as at the right moment when uh, food delivery was gaining traction, especially in Egypt, uh, we recognized that it's the time for us to pivot and uh, uh, basically establish a whole online ordering uh, operation and for that matter, a whole different company, honestly. That was 2017. 2017. And, 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 and who, who was already there? Uh, globally, you already had some companies, yes. right? So. So there, there was a few hints of, of, of this uh, happening uh, at a global scale in a, in a successful way. So we had the earlier uh, Grubhub, uh, Yelp, uh, and, and them and E24 trying to do something. There was the Zomato, of course, which was very established by then. Um, and there was, you know, the, the typical logistics players who are, who've always been doing delivery uh, and, and delivery, delivery alone, which is basically the delivery heroes of the world and, 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 um, uh, and, and so forth. So, so, so it was picking up. In Egypt, however, it was a little bit delayed to come into uh, life uh, because there were several attempts that didn't really actually work well and weren't uh, figuring out how to nail the right customer experience. So when we came out in the, uh, into the light and uh, basically did the, the whole online ordering operation, which was massive, of course, for us to build it in, in a very short time, I think it was almost uh, less than a year with very, very little funding. So we came out into the light and before we realized it, so many people were ordering from us. Uh, we got you know to 100,000 uh, uh, orders in, uh, in, I think, less than a, a year, uh, less than a year's time. And, uh, and we proved that uh, there's a, a, a big problem in the market to be solved, not only on the decisions front, but also on the, on the whole order uh, streamlining and delivery front. When you moved to this model, was the company in its earlier version, which was essentially first party ad based, profitable or not? The, uh, the ad business was profitable. The ad business was profitable. Now you're putting in a huge amount of cost to pivot, pivot into a model, which frankly, let's be very honest, even the big guys that you've mentioned that came in and some of that came in later, I mean, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Talabat, et cetera, no one has proven that this model economically can work. 
I mean, they are growing and growing and growing and adding scale. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But so you have an existing profitable model. Mm. Maybe it doesn't have the same level of scalability or sexiness, but it's there. Yeah. And you're now adding cost with a model that has last mile, which is famously very difficult to implement. Uh, did you hesitate or you just said, look, everybody's doing it. I have to be in this game and we'll figure out profitability later. So the, the best uh, core advantage and asset that we have always had uh, until today is that we already had a big user base of people doing phone calls to the restaurants and we had a lot of traffic. And we, because of that traffic, we always also knew which restaurants are the popular ones. So that really made us super efficient. We're actually one of the most uh, um, uh, unit economics positive companies at such an early stage globally. Like we have managed to achieve positive unit economics at such an early stage while there was no company basically achieving that except if they get into the maybe pre pre Because you didn't or, have to spend so much in marketing. Am I right? right? Exactly. We already had the user base. Okay. So that was okay. that served us really well. Fantastic. So profitability was definitely an issue when we started. We didn't know how much this whole thing is going to cost us. But then over time, we kept, you know, the, uh, optimizing and figuring out which are the right users and the, the right restaurants to have on the platform. And that made us super lean and, and, and efficient. So profitability was not that big of an issue like it, it is for a lot of the global players maybe coming into the country or opening up in their own countries even. So the, the, you've pivoted now. Now you have a new company. Uh, walk us through what happened since then. A lot of the things that we discover on the way, so value number one uh, for us in the company is basically customer empathy. We um, put our, ourselves in the shoes of the users, the foodies, the restaurants, the drivers. Um, and this really helps us be close to the ground and understand uh, all the problems and challenges that they're facing. So we figured out a couple of things. One is that users, uh, um, uh, we continue to expand and solve their um, uh, discovery problems, which is basically trying to personalize the dishes that come uh, to them in front of the feed. Surprisingly, this solves another problem for the restaurants, which restaurants that want to get discovered for the great food that they are uh, serving. So, so the, it, it makes the business model make so much sense in, in terms that we're connecting both in a very uh, specific way, not in a very generic way like all the other aggregators and platforms are, are doing. So that was uh, and remains to be a big problem that we're solving. Um, and then we figured out there's a lot of other challenges that we uh, need to solve for the restaurants. So restaurants aren't necessarily um, uh, that uh, good or focused in doing digital marketing, um, in attracting and retaining users, uh, in uh, figuring out what their operational KPIs are, um, whether it's for, for the delivery side or for uh, how internally the kitchen is operating. Um, and also they don't have uh, necessarily access to uh, um, uh, uh, banks uh, so that they can facilitate loans to help them uh, grow. So, and finally payments, of course. So all of that pose in very interesting challenges for us to solve. And this is really how we're now evolving as a company. We figured out the discovery part, we're personalizing it and enhancing it. And now we're adding layers on top of all the platform that help the restaurants uh, uh, get solve all of their problems and also for us to create better experiences for different kinds of, of, of users. We're going to dig into how Amir sees the bigger picture, namely the full F&B value chain and which segments and menu will go after, right after this short break. Welcome back. I'm Hashem Montasser, and you're listening to the Lighthouse Conversations with our guest Amir Alam, founder of El Menus. So you came in at a particular place in the value chain. You now understand that there is a, a larger value chain, of course, uh, and you are slowly trying to capture bigger pieces of that because you have already the data and because you already have the customer base uh, of a marketplace that's highly functional. Am I right in, in my understanding? 100%. So is the goal here to be toast? Is that, and by toast, just to be clear to my toast, it's not you go toast as in, in Miami, the whole thing collapses. <laughs> by toast, just for those that don't know, I'm talking about the American company toast, which also started relatively small in a piece of the value chain. Today is a public, publicly traded company with a huge IPO that happened a couple of uh, weeks ago, in fact. Uh, and they are now addressing many of those issues that you're talking about. They are essentially act as a platform for their restaurant operators. They are looking to provide loans as needed. They are looking to help them with payment systems in terms of uh, customers paying 
uh, directly from their phones, etc. Is that the ambition? Toast, of course, solves uh, a lot of the problems that we're solving, but they're solving it from a, a different angle, which is honestly uh, uh, a great advantage uh, for the restaurants that use them. Why is it a different angle? Uh, p- p- platforms like Toast come from the POS side. So they gather the data, they gather the transactions, they know the, the down deeper level details of uh, the customers that actually come in. Uh, to the restaurant, but we operate on a on a different model. We actually bring the customers in, so so we own the journey from the beginning because we help people with the decision. We tell them where to go and what to eat, and then when they go and they transact, probably that could end up in some POS platform. And you're not necessarily interested in the POS part, right? It's not really the most lucrative part. No, no, no. I, I think the, so many platforms are going to do a great job at that, uh, and we would uh, you know be agnostic and partner with them. Sort of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Partner with them to help at the end of the day the restaurant and create better experiences for the for the user. And again, each coming from a different angle can solve a very different problem. We can solve probably the marketing part in a much stronger way because again, we 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 help the user from the beginning of their journey in the decision part. We help with the last mile and the logistics because we deliver the the food for the restaurants to the users. Um, and with that, we are able to help restaurants optimize, figure out what their their best dishes are, how can they improve the experience further. Um, and and keep on uh, you know doing uh, other marketing uh, programs with us like loyalty and targeted acquisitions and ads. So so this is where we um, basically sit. When you first started, you said there was a revolution time. It was very difficult to get people to to focus uh, and and hire competent people. As you said, your CTO joined you in 2020. There is clearly a competitive market for talent not just in Egypt, but everywhere in startups. But Egypt is one good example. You also have an incumbent, uh, a, a competitor, Talabat, which has deep pockets, and a parent company that's very deep pocketed that could outspend you even as you're raising money. How are you looking to resolve this? How are you able to get talent in this market? Um, it's, it's definitely challenging. And I think globally, you will never find a country uh, or a startup that talks uh, like us now at the same moment in any in any other location in the world telling you, you know what, talent is super easy to find and it's actually not that competitive. I would I would like to meet that person or go to that country for that for that matter. But um I think it's 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 always challenging. And I think the 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 best talent joins companies that they believe in, uh, are aligned with the with the mission and vision and uh, those companies are able to provide a, a great experience for for those people to to thrive, right? Um, so, so I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's the same everywhere. But well, what's your pitch? Hashem today calls you, finds your number. Hi, Amir. I'm interested in hot tech or not. I, mean, I could be on the development side or not. Uh, but you know, how much are you paying me? I mean, are you giving me equity? Do I get free laundry? I mean, uh, you know, free food. I don't know. What's the pitch? Yeah. I, we get through the basics first, I guess, because I, I'll tell you the actual challenge in, in Egypt specifically, or, or a lot of the emerging markets, I guess, is that we haven't seen that many success stories yet. So people who are joining startups still today, still, you know, they're trying to figure out this new religion. Is it really working or am I still taking a bet, right? Uh, maybe the corporate life was better for me or being in my family business was the best option. 100%. So I think we're still yet to see a couple of success stories that then uh, create a much bigger boom. But we've we've seen it already, like in the past two years, uh, even my friends personally, I get calls like every single week of someone wants to start a, a new company or join a startup that they want to ask about. So I think that has dramatically shifted. Uh, the other thing as well is that, the, the, especially with COVID, the, the map has opened up, right? Attracting talent is not necessarily anymore from the same country. You can attract talent from many different parts of the world and you might not get to ever see them. And they can be do you do people. that? Do you have people on your team that are from outside of uh, Egypt? Definitely, definitely. We 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 have now a, a small office in uh, Dubai, even uh, where we have our data science team. Um, since that has been something that has been lacking in the country, more or less, um, for data scientists that operate at at a, at a big scale like ours. Um, so so the, we started off with that, and we imagine we, we're going to be you know very open minded about a couple of other uh, uh, you know functions uh, to hire as well in in Dubai or maybe other countries. So, so I think that has changed the game uh, a lot, even and, and made it even more competitive for people in in Egypt as well to step up and and like join startups, learn quickly, uh, accelerate their their skill set so that they can compete on the global uh, world map. 
So, so I think this is the uh, current dynamics that are, are happening in the market. So you have clearly moved away or moved moved on, which congratulations on that from the scary bits at the very early, which which was many years. It wasn't like a short period of time where you're probably worried about, can you keep the company going, you know, funding issues. Now you have a model that clearly uh, seems to work. You have funding interest, you're raising larger rounds, higher valuation. There's also a global playbook for what you're doing that investors and uh, and users are starting to recognize. What wakes you up at night at this stage? Yeah, at this stage, so definitely number one is, is, is for me, uh, differentiation all the time. Uh, what are we doing differently? How can we get better? How can we optimize? Um, and, um, and, I, and I think there is a, a little bit of um, excitement, of course, when you when you think about problems like that, because high class problem, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a not like why do we exist, which is a much bigger problem. Uh, there, there is, of course, little bits of that. It's happy to <laughs> to, to to question your existential problems every now and then, but uh, I think the the, the interesting things uh, that we currently think about or, or that keeps me up at night are, are challenges that relating to. How do we keep pushing the bar uh, further? Because it's a competitive market. There is, uh, as you mentioned, the playbook globally. Any global player can can maybe uh, enter the market and try uh, try their uh, take a stab at it. Um, but it's 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 the, the constant thing that that will keep us always much better than any other global um, competitor or player or or any uh, uh, basically platform in the market is to always differentiate and keep listening to what the users have to say. Um, and I I question a lot. Are we doing everything that we can for our uh, customers and users and drivers? Um, um, and, and this is really what, what keeps me busy most of the time. Can you see yourself operating out of outside of Egypt? And if so, which countries would you have on your radar if we take a one to five year view? Yeah, great question. So, so basically, w- the major thing is um, um, we are, because of our experience in Egypt, we believe that uh, we have been able to crack a lot of the challenges that um, a lot of the other emerging markets uh, are facing as well. So Egypt is uh, has uh, still a very low online ordering penetration compared to other markets uh, that are more developed. Um, and with that, you know, we educate the restaurants, we educate the drivers, we educate the users. Uh, so we believe with the same dynamics, we can uh, thrive in other countries that uh, have the similar demographics as well. So, so this is a priority number one for us, markets with similar uh, challenges. Um, the second part is uh, uh, markets that have uh, similar problems. So surprisingly, till today, that globally, there aren't discovery platforms uh, in every country that have uh, succeeded in, again, solving the question of what will I eat today? Uh, and we believe this is step two for us, is, uh, is getting into countries that have um, a, a lack of those uh, kind of platforms, and um, and we we would be able because of the nature of uh, dynamic nature of the platform to expand in different modes. Um, so we we're, we're going to choose countries and the products that we're going to offer in in different ways. So you answer without answering. So countries that fit this model would be more like a Nigeria as opposed to Dubai, say. Yeah, yeah. Africa, so sub-Saharan Africa is sort of similar to that because the Gulf is not that. The Gulf is no, no. outside of Saudi, not that dense, high penetration already, et cetera, and very, and very busy. I mean, busy and competitive. Um, so so would that be the natural kind of maybe sub-Saharan Africa, South, Southeast Asia, potentially? Priority number one is Africa. This is a, okay. it's a huge continent, a huge market, uh, and uh, a, a population that is uh, digitized, uh, digitizing, and and has a very young population as well, similar to Egypt. Um, and um, and and there's still lack of good local platforms that are solving the actual challenges, not a one size fits all kind of platform uh, coming from from outside of the continent. And what is your goal here, personal goal? I mean, you've been doing this for for 10 plus years now. Is the ultimate goal here, you know, maybe I go sell the company to a Talabat type company or someone else and retire and move to my yacht? Or would it be you see yourself doing this for the next 10, 15 years and literally building a company? I mean, we have a, a common friend, Fadi Randur. And yeah. I had spoken to him about this and, you know, he, they built this company over 30 years, went from one market to, you know, emerging market company, eventually listed it. Would that be more the way you're thinking about things or, you know what, I brought to the point where I can, this is now 
خلاص I, I feel like I've done my part let yeah. others continue the journey and you'll move to other things because maybe you're a serial entrepreneur and you have other problems as you said earlier <laughs> that you want to resolve yeah I, I I think the the this answer keeps evolving because the the bigger we get the the bigger the opportunities that we see right and uh, on day one I, I I wouldn't have figured out exactly what kind of uh, you know um, opportunities there would be uh, nine years later. Um, and uh, and today when we look at uh, what we've done and what we've achieved and and we've done, we've done that very efficiently and with very little, um, I'm I'm actually pretty um, you know curious and very uh, excited about what we, can, what we can do with with much more in so much bigger of a of a of a, of a footprint uh, globally. Um, and there is excitement that in Egypt with very few startups that have actually made it big. Uh, that we lead the pack in terms of uh, Egyptian companies that have managed to succeed and, and be a true tech company, not an operations company with a tech enablement, an actual tech company. What is an actual tech company? That's a very good point. So I am in a similar business, as you know, and um, where we are working on tech enablement. I'm in nowhere tech company, but I see a lot of my uh, peers here trying to masquerade as tech companies because their valuation goes from two times revenue to uh, 50 times revenue, quite literally. Spot on. There, there is no wrong or right way to do it, but I, I just believe that uh, the more you are, um, uh, you know, at the core a tech company, first of all, the definition is every single problem that you see, you solve with technology. You don't go out and like throw lots of people at it and, uh, and, and you know, become very asset heavy and then call yourself, I'm a, I'm a technology company. Of so so you know the biggest technology companies globally are almost have no assets. Uh, they're, they're they're very lean. You know this, these memes that come up every single day and tell you uh, you know Airbnb that owns no rooms and no hotels and Uber that doesn't own any cars and, and all of that. It's, it's actually a quite smart meme. So I think this is this is the kind of uh, companies that will make it really big. Can I just push back on this for a minute? What about hybrid models? I mean, you're seeing I'm in 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 their F and B business as well, and I see. Lots of opportunities and synergies between online and offline. There are certain experiences that you get offline that you can never get online and vice versa. Do you see uh, potentially uh, for yourself or for other companies a, a hybrid model? Definitely. I think especially because so many um, uh, you know businesses have not been digitized and have not really uh, been tech enabled. It's super natural for so many of the, of the startups uh, to go and solve their challenges by actually doing what they are doing, right? Uh, like if you see logistics businesses not really operating at a, at a, at a good efficiency, you're going to go and do it yourself and uh, be a, a full stack kind of uh, company. Uh, if you, um, you know, go and figure out that the restaurants aren't doing that much well on being efficient, uh, delivering food quickly enough, uh, lowering their costs, you're going to do a cloud kitchen. So the hybrid model really works. Uh, I guess the, the the thing is that that doesn't become the main uh, uh, you know growth lever for the company. Not every single thing that you would see, you'd say, let's build uh, that in the offline world. You have to have a very strong technological component to scale uh, in, a, in a much more accelerated way. So hybrid models are great. I think they're super important, especially for markets where uh, still, a lot of business haven't been digitized and, and not efficient enough. If you look today at your restaurant partners, what would you say is the number one pain point that you recognize that you feel you could potentially help them resolve? So, I, yeah, I, I guess that's a, it's a conversation, right? <laughs> I'm sitting talking <laughs> with, with, with a big restaurant operator uh, and, and you definitely have a lot of way and maybe, maybe you can pitch in. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you from what I see, yes. uh, is um, it's essentially... Uh, um, again, a marketing problem. If I would, if I would to summarize it, I think uh, acquiring and retaining the right customers, and that's it. And getting feedback, of course, on how to um, uh, keep them coming back. So, so this is, I think, the age-old problem of all the restaurants. Um, and and this is the starting point. Anything else later on, of course, operations, logistics, uh, the hassle of like uh, inventory management uh, and costing, and all of that is is is, is second nature. But I think. Um, it's it's um, they are relatively easier problems to solve, but if you have no customers coming into your door or not coming back, then whatever else you're doing does not uh, add up, right? It doesn't. Hundred uh, percent. Yeah. But but of course, love to hear your own view on this. No, I think you're hundred percent right. I mean, we discussed this offline. If you recall when you came, I mean, some yeah. of the areas that. Uh, 
I see are very similar to what you're seeing. I mean, what we we have done is uh, being a company that uh, started obviously more as a in, a in a physical world is trying to today address the pain points one by one through technol technology enablement uh, that adds efficiency internally and externally. The other thing we're trying to do is to exactly your point on marketing, meet the customer whenever we can. That's not always means in the restaurants itself, right? So this could be on social media, this could be on our website, this could be on Twitter, this could be by them walking in. And I'm trying to create a consistent customer experience wherever we meet the customer. It's, it's a challenging, uh, but I think that's very much at the core of um, creating a model that's efficient. And of course, cloud kitchens have enabled all of us to today potentially grow your footprint much more aggressively without needing every time to, to commit to a massive amount of CapEx and new building. But interestingly enough, the, the opposite of that, that's a different conversation altogether is, you and I know this, we have many companies that think that just by being cloud kitchens or digital brands, that's going to resolve their problem. It's not the case because the real estate online is as competitive. Maybe there's more noise and they realize quickly that even if they spend a lot of money on marketing, it doesn't mean that their brand pops. So interestingly enough, what we have seen here in, in the UAE, as an example, many of the successful ones have been hybrid in the sense that the customer recognizes the brand, but those guys are also smart at creating online a similar uh, relevance to their customers by being close to them. But uh, being a pure online brand has been, frankly, more disappointing than not. A few examples uh, have done well. One or two of those companies have been acquired by the likes of Kitopi, which raised a lot of money, as you know. But it's it, it has been unresolved. So time time will tell. Um, it's a very interesting uh, question. So so basically, you, you're saying bridging the experience. You you need to bridge that bridging experience the experience. From, optical. Offline, online, vice versa. Okay. One hundred percent. And and thinking in in both those ways, which is difficult. I think for for Hanya and I, maybe uh, our advantage lies in the fact that we didn't grow up in this business. I think if I was came from a traditional F and B business, I can understand it's uh, all of a sudden changing your thinking. But I didn't grow up in that thinking, so I don't really care if we yeah, approach yeah. it differently. Um, but it is challenging, and uh, we are certainly trying to learn from people like yourself to think about the digital enablement in a in a consistent way. Again, that's not necessarily for us first nature. It is to you. Um, but we're learning and surrounding ourselves with as many intelligent people that we can, to, that we can have a dialogue with. I have um, um, one final question, because obviously you have your pulse in the market in Egypt. There's been so many changes in the culinary and F&B scene in Egypt. I mean, when I was there last few months ago, uh, we talked about this you and I offline again. I was just amazed. I mean, so many things have changed. So many new places opened up. What are the current trends you're seeing? What are people eating? What's hot? What's not? Because that has changed quite a bit. Hundred percent. No, the trends in Egypt are crazy. Like we are, <laughs> I think, the the fastest country to get trends in and out in no time. You cannot. It was totally unpredictable. And because, you know, people are so uh, intertwined together and we're, we're a very tribal kind of uh, culture, uh, just, you know, get, get one trend out. And if it, if it just clicks in two days, yes. you find cues. <laughs> all the same 100%. Method. That's exactly my experience. So, so for, for example, this year we've had a fried chicken craze for, uh, for quite a while. <laughs> I think it was almost like disrupting traditional uh, fried chicken players who've done not much to, to change their, their, you know, their style or offering for a long time. And then suddenly there's like people trying to innovate with that concept and taking it in all sorts of ways, like building, you know, triple deckers, uh, putting so much toppings onto it to the point that you need uh, to, to, to plan how a you're going to <laughs> exactly like a shovel to start uh, digging through it literally um, and it gets uh, very very tricky so so I think that was one of the the, 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 the major trends that we've seen uh, there has been um, uh, of course the the dining trend uh, as well uh, uh, of course people this year were more keen to go back to to going out and like traveling farther places and uh, and literally like so so many people I've I've been surrounded with even uh, make it a point that we're gonna go to restaurants that are farther away from our uh, location. So that was that was happening for quite a while, but of course um, uh, uh, delivering food. Um, uh, so so food delivery has also uh, as a trend this year 
uh, become enormously big. It's 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 accelerating in a magnificent way. Uh, and this is, of course, because the market is getting more educated and, and the flywheel is, is coming into place. Uh, so other other than the than the actual ch- food trends of different cuisines, we're also seeing that change in behaviors. And I think you've said this in one of the articles that I read in preparation for this in one of your interviews. I mean, and you're absolutely right. I remember as a, not child, but as a teenager, we were, I think, one of the first, if not the first, to have McDonald's delivery. I mean, this was before anyone yeah. else in the world. So exactly. Egypt has always been about convenience, Cairo especially. Yeah but all the major cities um, in the early days. And I think now you're really seeing an explosion. I mean, seeing in Alexandria and Sahel over the summer that literally uh, everything is being delivered. I mean, uh, absolutely incredible. Yeah, sometimes even to your to, to, to the beach, to where you're sitting. <laughs> it's, uh, Definitely it's, uh, to the beach. I think the beach is key. The beach is key. Nobody wants to uh, <laughs> go and... Me, uh, one, one wants to move once they're at the beach. Move, uh, outside of the beach, 100%. So, so yes, you're spot on on that. Amir, uh, thank you. It's been a uh, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Hashim, so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Lighthouse Conversation with me, Hashem Montasser. We're produced by Chirag Desai and our content director is Farah Sharif. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow us on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Also, check our previous episodes, including our conversation with Chris Khalifa, founder of Egyptian street food brand Zuba. Please find us on Instagram at thelighthouse underscore AE or send us an email at connect at thelighthouse.ae. And please share a link with your friends if you've enjoyed this episode. We'll see you again in two weeks.